traits original to this culture in the archaeological record. But this was the culture that we tend to think of as the mound building culture, the Mississippian culture, um, a culture that evidently uh, has its roots in the Mississippi, Missouri sort of general river valley uh, system, and which was one of the major um, city cultures in North America. We usually don't think of North America as a a place where cities existed in pre-Columbian times, but of course they did. There's a, a huge misperception of what Native American communities were like in the later literature, largely because um, disease wiped out the Native population to such an extent in the early, the first century, essentially, uh, after contact, that um, later uh, statistical appraisals of how big the population had been in pre-Columbian times was enormously off. That is, people tended to underestimate it, to think that, you know, there's this big land of forests and there were a few scattered bands of people living by hunting and gathering uh, around and they hardly disturbed the environment. You probably read, uh, what's his name, uh, Mann's uh, 1491, which sort of tries to bring together all of the new archaeological perspectives that show how populated the Americas were before the coming of the Europeans and uh, the role that disease played in, in, first of all, altering the map, make, making all these cultures disappear in uh, just a, a generation or so, and then uh, also leading later scholars to form completely wrong historical hypotheses on what uh, these early civilizations had been like. So looking at North America, in fact, we can see that you know, we tend to think of as Central America as having these big urban civilizations and this building and this sophisticated organization. And, uh, you know, then when you get to North America, you have this kind of romantic tribal culture where people live by, uh, by hunting and gathering and don't disturb the land and all that. Um, in fact, uh, there was no break between Central America and North America. There was a continuous exchange of cultural artifacts and of ideas that extended all the way up to the Great Lakes uh, through the Mississippi Basin. And uh, you had similar urban communities all the way up uh, that area. And um, these people, nowadays we tend to think of American Indians as being in tribes. We tend to think of everything as a tribal organization. Um, I don't think that uh, the inhabitants of these communities would have thought of themselves as tribes, or they wouldn't have understood the concept of tribe very well. Um, this was still not the case at the time of the, the removal of these uh, peoples in the southeast of Oklahoma in the beginning of the 19th century, what was left of them there. Um, they tended to think of themselves as citizens of particular communities. And uh, their political organization was very much like city-states in Europe, in early Europe, in classical Greece, for instance. These were small political units, but they were based on place and on your being an inhabitant of the place. They were not a kind of uh, extended family. You know, people felt that they were kin in some way. There, was, uh, there were family metaphors used in describing their relationships to each other, but they were mainly citizens. They were mainly the, the, the people of a particular community, and they thought of their community as territorial. You know, there's, there's group of people living there and they have this land around them that is theirs and they have certain relationships with people beyond that community. They could be tributary relationships, that is, their community is more powerful and so these other smaller communities pay tribute to them, or they can be hostile relationships, <laughs> they're trying to, they're constantly at war with these other communities over resources that are in between, or they're allies, they're equal allies. And uh, in uh, uh, because this culture complex, what we tend to think of as a southeastern culture complex, um, covered such a wide area, and it was obviously uh, the focus of a lot of trade, a lot of exchange over this area, it's hard to figure out exactly who were the, the people who started it culturally. Um, the, um, you can see aspects of the original mythology and worldview that was obviously the religion of, the, of this 
uh, cultural complex spread across a very wide area um, involving people speaking languages that aren't particularly related to each other. Um, certainly Cherokee culture, for instance, has a lot of material that comes from this. Um, even if you go all the way up into the northeast and into this area, you'll see you know, a lot of Algonquian ideas are in some ways related, and a lot of Iroquois ideas are somehow related to uh, the imagery that comes out of this cultural complex. However, what seems to be most likely when you look at the types of peoples who seem to have retained most of this material in, into modern times is that the language of the core culture that spread through the Mississippi area and influenced all of these other uh, cultural groups around them was probably Muskogee, or the language that was ancestral to the the Muskogean languages today, that is, the, the people who speak Creek, or what they call Muskogee, uh, and uh, Chickasaw and Choctaw, and uh, uh, the uh, languages of, of uh, Florida, like like Chiti and, and uh, Mikoski, and, um, and Koshata in Alabama. Uh, these are still languages that are spoken today by small groups of people. Uh, Creek is Muskogee and seems to have been the, probably the central uh, language group that carried this culture, although probably the, the, uh, the language that was spoken by the people who lived in these city-states back in our Middle Ages in North America probably spoke the language that was ancestral to all of the Muskogean languages today. And um, the... Um, the Creek Indians, or Muskogee Indians, or the Seminoles are a, are a branch of them that fled to Florida at the time of the, the Indian removals and a little before, um, have preserved a ceremonial, even though most of them converted to Christianity, they've preserved a ceremonial tradition that they call the, the stomp ground religion, or stomp ground ceremonial, or stomp dance. And um, a lot of anthropologists feel that that is, in fact, what survives of the religion of the the southeastern cultural complex. Um, if you've seen or heard of uh, sort of stump dance ceremonials, they are very, very different from other Native American, you know, powwow type uh, dance and performance that you might be more familiar with across North America. They're, they have very different movements, very different dance style organizations. The music is totally unlike anything in the powwow tradition. It's not at all influenced by Plains Indian musical styles. Uh, in a way, it sounds uh, a little more like uh, the kind of Indian music you hear in South America. And it's very cool in response. Uh, it tends to have a rather pure notes rather than sliding notes. And, and to have a sort of very full-throated quality. It's not sort of high up in the nose the way a lot of uh, power style of singing is. Um, so, um, from all of the traditions that have survived, either as folk tales that are still told in Native American communities that come out of this uh, cultural background, and um, uh, through uh, what you can tell from the artwork, from the symbolism of art objects that come out of this cultural complex, people have been trying to figure out what exactly the religion was like in its earliest form, in its form when it was the national religion, more or less, of these city-states. Um, and uh, there's a very interesting book that I've used a lot for this uh, presentation by um, Charles Hudson, who's a, an anthropologist in down south. I think he's in Georgia or North Carolina. But he uh, wrote a book that was called uh, Conversations with the High Priest of Cusa. Kusa was the, city, the main city-state of the Muskogee-speaking people uh, around the time of European contact. Uh, uh, De Soto visited Kusa on his ra rampage <laughs> across the southeastern uh, part of the continent. And um, Kusa was, was a state that um, had many tributaries. It was the most powerful state, and it had other states that paid tribute to it, and it was often at war with them, demanding tribute but it was like the prestige center of uh, that culture at that time. So what Hudson did is, uh, through looking at all of the available material, archaeological and anthropological, 
he imagined, he presented as a fiction, because part of it is a fiction, it's a reconstruction uh, you know, from his own imagination, his own efforts uh, at putting it together, of uh, a priest, a missionary priest, who is accompanying the DeSoto expedition, and who's trying to sort of scout out the area and see what kind of missionary efforts might be successful there. And so he wants to study the religion of the place, and so he uh, essentially meets the high priest of Kusa, and who's a rather interesting character, with a raven perched on his shoulder. And um, the priest decides that maybe it might be worth teaching this man. And so there's a series of conversations in which he gradually tries to teach his religion to this Catholic priest. And the Catholic priest, of course, wants to learn, so even though he has no respect for this religion at all, and in some ways is absolutely appalled by it, um, listens respectfully, you know, and, and tries to learn as much as he can. And it's presented in a rather lively way. There's a kind of story background with uh, the interpreter, who's a, a, a Kusa woman who was taken away as a slave, and then was liberated by the Spanish, and then just came back, converted to Christianity, came back with them. Now finds herself in the community where she grew up, and is having uh, is torn between the two cultures. So that creates a kind of romantic backdrop to the story. But the the presentation is very interesting in that he. Um, he tries to, to use material primarily from, from Creek Muskogee uh, sources, but um, he recognizes that a lot of this ceremonial complex spread into other areas uh, in the eastern United States and in some ways might be better preserved, that is, some aspects of the stories might be better preserved in, um, uh, among other cultural groups that are not Muskogee. So he uses a lot of Cherokee stories, for instance, where they seem to fill in gaps that, isn't, that aren't well represented in the, the Creek material. And um, so he, he gives a coherent idea of the cosmology and the emergence myths and the, the general sort of uh, social guidance myths that exist in Kusa culture. Now what I find very interesting about the uh, Muskogee religion, as presented in this way, and as I've seen it in other aspects of uh, anthropological research on it, is that as someone who spent a lot of time uh, thinking about pre-Christian Celtic religion and what it felt like to live in a pre-Christian Celtic community, the world of you, one had the sort of guidance about social behavior, one got from one's community, that um, the uh, Muskogee pattern is very, very similar. It's not the same by any means, but it's very similar. Um, someone from either of those communities transplanted into the other would have instantly recognized a lot of key features. And even though physically the uh, surroundings might have been really different, right, uh, they would have found uh, ways of exchanging information ways of conveying important things to each other using common images. And uh, I thought that this was a very useful step in answering the question that you often hear posed by people who are interested in, who have, say, have a Celtic background and want to practice a Celtic tradition of some sort in North America. And they come to realize that, well, Celtic tradition is very land-based. It's very much about your relationship with the land. Your community can't exist separate from, from its landscape. Uh, you're always communing with the forces in the land that give you growth and nurture and such. And so, and so you, um, if you're in a different continent with a different kind of um, habitat around you, you wonder, how am I going to do this? Because th these features of the landscape have different associations, they have different cultural associations. We don't have uh, a record of Celtic people using them for anything. What we do have, if we go back far enough, or if we live in a community that actually still has native uh, population, but in most of the East there isn't. So, <coughs> what you say, well, Native Americans used these places, so there's always a temptation of saying, well, let's pretend to be Native Americans and sort of go in and uh, learn what they did and do the same thing in that same place and try and uh, assimilate their beliefs and, and uh, apply these beliefs to these particular ceremonials that 
we're sort of trying to reconstruct or thinking we understand as we, we uh, uh, practice them. New age. <laughs> the, 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 remember the ghost dance problem? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. The uh, 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 new age group decides to uh, to perform, it finds a record of the ghost dance whose the uh, point to, to which was to uh, bring man back in harmony with the land. And so they decide to perform it. Unfortunately, what they didn't realize was that the mechanism by which the, the, the makers of the ghost dance felt that uh, bringing man back into harmony in the land meant all them white folks dead or gone. Yes, so, which means that if they had actually gotten it to work, what would have happened is they would have all got brought dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bad idea. So, um, now one of the problems involved in, in this kind of uh, approach to traditional religions, and I find this a, a pervasive problem in neo-paganism in general, is that you tend to look at the shift in religion to some other tradition as worshipping particular gods. That is. The way you think is, I'm, you know, okay, I, I was brought up, say, in a Christian background. Well, I'm no longer going to worship Jesus, but I'm going to worship some character I got out of a book that appeals to me more, and I'm going to worship him pretty much the way I would worship Jesus, <laughs> except that this is a different character, right? Um, there's this sort of pervasive Protestant attitude that, you know, there's nothing between me and my deity, and uh, basically it's about having this buddy, you know, who, whom you talk to once in a while, you know, whether you, you're a, a goth and so you want to have tea with a morrigan all the time, or, uh, you know, or something that's more warm and fuzzy. But it's very much that attitude of, of uh, uh, choosing a particular icon that's going to be your imaginary friend. And um, without any kind of, of uh, interest, even, in where this figure originally fit in the context of the religion you took him out of. That is, you're not really borrowing the religion that this figure was part of, you're just borrowing the figure, and you're making the figure conform to, basically, your, your internalized sense of what a religion works like, which is usually Protestant Christianity, you know, with the parts you don't like taken out of it. And this is what I see pervasive in neo-pagan um, attitudes towards other pantheons. This may not be the case, say, with Wicca, where you're working with an actual system that's been invented primarily uh, for practice, but it's very commonly the attitude taken towards uh, older traditions. Yeah. And so when you're confronting the problem, well, how am I going to practice Celtic religion? How am I going to practice, say, Native American tradition? Um, you think of it in terms of God. Yeah. So you think of it that you're going to have to worship particular gods to make your practice either Celtic or Native American or Norse or whatever. You're not thinking of uh, the practice itself. Mm. You're not thinking that what was important for the community was how you related. You know, not who you related to, but how you related to whatever. <laughs> and um, so when people say, well, we should um, follow Native American customs, we should basically worship Native American figures in the landscape where the worship was originally organized, and then we're going to have to uh, copy Native American ceremonials that we don't really understand, you know, because we had nobody really to teach them to us, we just got them out of a book, and we're trying to figure them out, you know, just according to our own imagination, according to the way we feel about them, from our own cultural background, and then, of course, we confuse everybody else's um, notion of what these ceremonials are, which you've seen happening over a generation now. Um, what I'm more interested in, of course, because, again, I approach religious traditions of, through context, through what it means to the people practicing them, or what it meant to the people practicing them, if it's a discontinued tradition. And um, I'm more interested in, say, how the deities relate to each other, uh, how the deities relate to people, you know, why the, the people go to these deities, um, how they conceive of the relationship that they have with the deities, and how they conceive of the world around them, 
which of course serves as the backdrop for their relationship with deities. Often the relationship with the world in a larger sense is more important than the relation to the deities because the deity is just one part of this much larger environment that you're in. And so that's the part that I'm interested in, in, in understanding. And uh, that's the way I approach Celtic religion. I don't approach it through deities, you know, through sort of the so-and-so is the Irish god of fire and so-and-so is the Gaulish god of rain or whatever, because that's not the way the Celts thought about their deities anyway. Um, I'm more interested in the, the larger picture and how any kind of deity would fit into that picture. So, if I look at both Muskogee culture and Celtic culture from that point of view, um, I see some very interesting parallels, and these parallels, I think, are very deep. That is, they're not just, oh, well, gee, they both have a snake doing the same thing, you know. It's more um, that the reason the similarities are there is because they begin at a very, very deep level, the way you conceive of the cosmos. So let's look at the Muskogee uh, cosmos, or rather the southeastern ceremonial uh, cosmos. And... Um, the, the world has a, a central intelligence in it. There's a god. Um, the god is imminent in the universe. That is, in a way, he's larger than the universe, but he sort of begins to be aware inside the universe. And in um, Muskogee languages, he's called various words that mean the master of breath. That is, he is... What makes things be alive? He animates the world. The world would be dry without him. And through him, the world is wet. Uh, wetness, water, of course, is what you need in order to grow, in order to live. So you think of life as wet and death as dry. And um, the Master of Breath divided the world into two sections. And the primal section is represented by a circle. Uh, the circle is the upper world. And it's white. Its color is white. And it represents absolute clarity. Everything that has a mind is originally tied to the upper world. And all living things that are sentient in some way, and that includes pretty much all living things, um, are linked to the upper world, that is, what makes them themselves has its template in the upper world. This is, um, Plato would have called this the world of the archetypes, right? That is, everything that you can categorize, that you can think about clearly, that you can say, yes, this is what it is, and it's not that other thing, but right? it lives here, its origin is here, is where all concepts are made clear. It's white because white light um, pervades everything and doesn't allow things to remain hidden in shadow. So in that world, nothing is hidden in shadow. Everything is absolutely clear. So spirit comes from here. However, when you detach this from all that there is, you're left with Everything that is part of material manifestation is left over and it becomes the world below, the underworld. The underworld is the world of chaos. It's where you're not sure of anything. It's where nothing is conscious. It's where everything is always changing into everything else. There are just these forces that are constantly pushing against each other and causing all form to, trans to transform continuously. And so the way you present it is through a series of wave patterns. <laughs> and uh, on uh, pottery that comes from the southeastern cultural area, from the Mississippian mound building sites, um, you often see this as a motif, as an artistic motif, the upper world and the, uh, the lower world. Now, between the underworld and the upper world, of course, is the world where we live, which is neither, because we're hybrid creatures. We partake of both mind and material manifestation of matter. 
and we are somehow organizing this chaos into at least temporary forms that have continuity. And this was originally not possible without the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars with something that will mark time, will mark periodicity, will create some sense of order that is visible from below. Could we stop? No, he's, he's not necessarily male. Because you're using the yeah. he pronoun. He because they don't, they don't have he or she in the scope case. So. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's like the first, <laughs> like, yeah, it's so, like the yeah. first, uh, like the first uh, chapter of the Bible where God is yeah, exactly. defined by a pronoun which is neither male mm -hmm. nor female, but mm -hmm. a encompassing one. They never translate it that well, way. Well, actually, it is. It's he, but it's uh, sort of a, a, a feminine plural uh, oh. noun form. And God speaks of himself or herself as we. Ah, yeah. Good. Amazing how they conveniently forget that. Mm. Okay, so, in order to have some kind of order, you need to have some kind of periodicity. And this is represented by the sun and moon. The creation of the sun and moon, the master of breath actually makes the sun and moon so that he can somehow unite the above and the below. And the sun and moon aren't actually in the above. They're not part of the upper world. They're in just below the upper world. They're tied to our world in some way. They're like the first intimation of our world that we're going to inhabit that's not there yet. And um, the way they're represented in art, this well, you have another circle inside, and they quarter the year between them. They create, uh, they create the seasons, and they're represented by a cross, which is the space, you know, space and time. And so that represents the original world. So they had space four and time seasons? Uh, no, actually they, they had, well yes, they actually did. It depended on, on um, they had 13 moons. They were actual lunar, strict lunar months. And uh, each of them was marked by a festival, which uh, related to a particular crop, not necessarily a cultivated crop, but a, maybe a wild fruit that was harvested at that time. And there was always a, uh, a larger symbolism attached to it. That is, it wasn't just about getting the fruit, although that was like, the main ceremonial occasion, but there was always uh, some other plant and some animal that was associated with that, and a particular hunt that would take place that uh, would make it a larger change occurring throughout all of the uh, realms of nature. Um, so, uh, sun and moon, by the way, are uh, male and female, but not the way we imagine them from Greek uh, mythology. Uh, the sun is female, the moon is male. Same as in the Norse? Yes, <laughs> same as in the Celtic instrument. Yeah. So, so uh, um, then, um, there's still no place for physical beings to live in, because this is chaos, you can't really live in it. And this is mind, you can't really live in that. So the first really physical beings are sun and moon, but they're not really capable, they don't live on the land. And so in order for the, the, all the animals that live in here, and that don't really have a way of having bodies and of living on the, in a physical world, you have to create a physical world for them. So uh, Muskogee uh, mythology, like very many Cultures across Eurasia have an, an earth diver myth. Um, again, all of the Indians on the, the eastern half of the continent have this myth, and uh, a lot of them in the western areas, although of course in the southwest and California have completely different in concepts. Um, and the idea is, of course, that an animal is chosen to, um, to dive into chaos, right? There's all this watery chaos. And down below is actually dry land. And you have to be able to bring it out of chaos into manifestation on the surface. Mm. In um, Indo-European mythology doesn't really have this myth. That was not part of the, the creation myth as uh, it was originally promulgated. Uh, the typical Indo-European creation myth is that uh, you have two divine figures and one of them sacrifices the other. And uh, the sacrificed being becomes everything. It become, becomes the physical world. And you still have that in ritual where you recognize that uh, this giant that was sacrificed uh, is still manifested in the, f 
the features of the landscape, and when you're doing a sacrifice, you're giving back some of that essence so that these features in the landscape can remain. You know, the two eyes are the sun and the moon. And the, mm -hmm. the hair is, is the focus. Ymir is one example yeah. of that, but you, you find that throughout the Indo-European world, mm -hmm. you have variations on that myth. Uh, the oldest one that we have is, of course, this is the Vedic one, the, the supreme sacrifice, the original sacrifice in, in Vedic mythology in India. That's the basis of why you do sacrifice in general. It's the, the original template for it. And the Celts had exactly that same notion, that same understanding. But uh, the southeastern Indians had the, uh, the earth diver myth. The earth diver myth is found in Europe, but among Finno Ugric speakers. The Finno Ugric people have the earth diver myth as their creation myth. In, in Finnish and Estonian and, and the native peoples in, in Russia. So, the earth when it was brought up was square, and it is still square. It's an expanse that is quadrilateral, and it has to be knotted into place, otherwise it will fall apart. So, you made a knot, say for the north, which was blue, and you made a knot for the south, which was white, and you made a knot for the west, which was um, black, and a knot for the east, which was red. And so, again, you see this motif. This. On uh, a lot of Mississippian art, a lot of the Southeastern ceremonial complex <coughs> has that motif, which looks sort of like a pillow, <laughs> and which is actually the earth. <laughs> the earth is shaped like that. And um, through, so the, the spirits of living beings came down onto this. And originally it was very flat and wet and hard to live on. But through their different activities, they gave it its features. They say that the turkey vulture, for instance, flew down and he flapped his wings all over it. And so splashing the mud around the uh, hills and valleys appeared and it ceased to be completely flat. And there were places for rivers to flow into and so forth. <clears throat> now, let's pause in this. This gives us a, a cosmology that we can look at. Um, you know, if you're living in this kind of culture, you're on this, and you see yourself as being between this world and this world. And um, so you have this chaos below you that is always in danger of overcoming the little order that you've created here in your, this little pillow here <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> that has been made of stuff that's been drawn up from here and with mind that's been brought down from there. And um, so a lot of your ceremonial is going to be involved with trying to keep it in the shape in which it is, prevent it from being frittered away. In uh, Muskogee imagination, this comes, it's featured in the knots. You're thinking of, uh, that the knots might unravel. And if the knots unravel, then the whole world will fall apart. So a lot of the ceremonial was involved with strengthening the knots of the four quarters of the world, so that no part loosens, you know, and then the earth loses its shape because one of the parts is not holding. So it's like a sandbag that starts losing its substance from, from one side. <clears throat> now, there are other characters that appear at this point. Um, the Earth now is a particular entity, and she has, she's female, and she has her, her own particular personality, and that she's, she's been brought back up out of chaos. And she's afraid of being brought back down into chaos. Um, among the animals that come down and populate the Earth, they each have their different personalities, their different ways of going about things. They are essentially divine beings in their archetypal forms, and they affect the world in different ways. Uh, one of them is a rabbit. Uh, rabbit is like Burr Rabbit in uh, southeastern folklore. He's the trickster. Um, he's not a nice trickster. Um, I mean, tricksters are usually not nice, per se, but they often have redeem redeeming traits, or they have endearing traits in, in some of the stories. Rabbit usually doesn't. Rabbit is presented as really stupid. A rabbit uh, does antisocial things out of rashness, uh, out of greed, He's basically unable to restrain himself in any of his impulses. 
and uh, sometimes the results aren't too bad, but often the results are catastrophic. And uh, Rabbit was snuggling up against his mother, the Earth, and uh, he developed an incestuous desire for the Earth, and he basically copulated with the Earth where he was lying, and out of that came the Horned Serpent. The Horned Serpent is a, a form of chaos that has come in to the earth through the copulation of rabbit and his mother, which is incest, and which is therefore is chaos. It's bringing about a breach in the normal way humans are socialized. So the horned serpent is the way through which chaos enters our world. This is not bad in uh, Muskogee thinking, because you have this a sense of chaos is what creation comes out of. You know, that you have to mix things you have to change the order of things for new things to come about. So you want, you need to have horned serpent there, but horned serpent is dangerous. You can't trust horned serpent. All you can do is try and tame him, try and keep him at bay, try and make sure that he stays within limits. Is there any link between that horned serpent and the one of the Celts? And That's the one what of the I'm Egyptians. about to show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Um, the other uh, creation that also comes about through an act of incest is the creation of thunder. And thunder, again, is an ambiguous character. Thunder is below the sun and the moon. He lives in the middle air, so it's sort of visible from the earth. And uh, he has a whole retinue of child thunders who accompany him. And he brings about, of course, thunder and lightning. He knows that he's kin to horned serpent in a way because they have the same kind of origin. And they have play battles with each other. They say that when thunder strikes lightning at the earth, it's, he's trying to strike the serpent. Like the water-keeping serpent. Yes, that's exactly who the horned yeah. serpent is. And so, um, they, uh, when you see a storm and you see the lightning actually striking the ground, right? basically it's thunder trying to strike at the horned serpent. But you can never really get the horned serpent. That also, uh, sounds, that also sounds like the eastern dragon. Uh, yes, yes, but not quite. The Eastern Dragon is a much more multifaceted and complex figure. But the notion that there's a serpentine being who is the master of water mm -hmm. and who has fertility connections and is also uh, ambiguous, that is, can be dangerous and can be helpful. Yeah, that's you a even see that, that in the Mithraic thing. serpent that's going for not only for the blood in the Tauroctony, mm -hmm. but also climbing up the crater in the banquet scene. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we have a thunder and horned serpent in here. The horned serpent has a, um, two horns. They're usually imagined as antlers. And one of them is red, representing summer, and one of them is blue, representing winter. Therefore, he represents the two halves of the year. Uh, Muskogee calendar makes a big division between summer and winter. And there's a change in ceremonial according to um, which part of the year you are in, what kinds of energies are informing the land. The horned serpent is evidently the master of both those processes. He contains the, the two uh, seasons in his being, as the spirit of uh, bringing about the changes in the land. Now, um, okay, now let's look at the Celtic version. If you're in a Celtic community, well, you think of there's a perfect world in which certain divine beings live. These are what I tend to call the gods above. They were just called the gods. And, and they have the gods and the anti-gods, the gods and the non-gods. I tend to call them the gods above, the gods below. And the gods above live in a world that is often represented by a circle because it's perfect. And it's the world of absolute clarity, again, where um, everything is done right. Everything is done accord, according to the spirit in which it was conceived. So uh, the, the gods that represent all the different crafts right, come from this upper realm, and they represent how that craft should be exercised in its perfect way. So you have you know, the great smith, you have the, the great warrior, you have the great Sagola, carpenter, you have all of the people who make up a normal human community, except in their divine form, they exist as perfect examples 
they do their work absolutely perfectly. They do it in a way that no human craftsman could equal, except that they could work towards it. They could try and emulate it. Um, <clears throat> now, you also have a watery underworld. Right? A watery underworld, which represents chaos, and uh, which is also the source of all fertility in life. Because, again, the notion that life is wet, uh, death is dry. But, um, insofar as the dead continue to live and are accessible, they live in the watery underworld. And they come back into our world um, from here. That is, this is the chaos that allows death to return into life. Life goes into death, but then it's reformed as life again. Now, what is in the middle? Well, we do have the sun and the moon, right? Um, the sun and the moon originally were, the sun was female, the moon was male. In most modern traditions, the moon is female too. You just have two female objects in the sky. But it's very clear uh, from uh, linguistics that originally the moon was, was male. <coughs> just like in Germanic cultures. And um, there are Tolkien's. Mm -hmm. We, yes, J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, yes, but he did that specifically because right. <laughs> of the Germanic languages. He wanted to sort of show that the Germanic worldview as relating to the heavenly bodies was different from the classical one that everyone is brought up with when you personalize the sun and moon. So, um, in the middle is Earth. Square. Yes, Earth is square. Hmm. And... Earth has a center and it has four quarters. And each of these quarters has a particular function, a particular uh, impact on the whole. We know that ceremonially, um, the north represented warriors, the east represented farmers, the west represented learned people. And the South represented everything else. The South represented what you couldn't really put into a form. Artists, especially. You know, artists get inspiration. You know, if you don't get that inspiration, if you're not good by yourself, if you don't have talent, then you're not an artist. It's different from being a craftsman, you know, who learns how to do something mechanically and could learn to be good at it, you know, without necessarily having a lot of innate talent. Whereas an artist has to have talent, otherwise. He's just a shoddy artist. So, <laughs> so uh, in a way, you can say that that's the part that's related to chaos, is the southern part. <clears throat> Interestingly, in ceremonial, they mirror the areas that they're actually seen as coming from. For instance, the east is where the sun rises, and it's the direction of fire, as it is in Muskogee, where red for fire is the color of the east. And uh, nevertheless, the direction of fire in ceremonial is, is west. It's reflected. You see, that what's in, in the earth reflects what happens in the other world, mm. what happens in the larger world that surrounds the earth. So it's like looking at things in a mirror when you're doing ceremonial. So the uh, enlightenment, the powers of the mind represented by fire, right, are in the west. They reflect fire. Water is in the west, at least if you're in Europe, right, you have the Atlantic on your west, and that's where the dead go, that's the, the watery chaos is sort of manifest from the earth as you go out west. Um, however, the direction of water and of fertility, and the farmers, right, everything that has to do with fertility and growth and reproduction, um, and wealth, right, <laughs> all of that, the third function, is in the west, because it's reflecting in the, in the east. In the, uh, in the east, right, yes, in the east, right, because it's reflecting what's there in the west. Um, similarly, um, the north, just like in Germanic tradition, is the direction of magic, it's the direction of mystery. However, in ceremonial, it's reflected, it's in the south. Mm -hmm. That's the goddess direction, that's the direction of, you know, everything that's left over, everything that's not <laughs> properly categorized, is in the south. And uh, the, the south, in our world, right, is the direction of heat, of warmth, of energy, and it's the male direction and the direction where warrior virtue uh, would seem to come from, but in ceremonial, it's reflected, it's in the north. North is the male direction in ceremonial, you know, south is the female direction. It's, it reverses mm. 
the original influences that come out of us, out of the larger world. But you still have, so you still have the sense of uh, a square world, a square earth, with four parts to it that all have to work in tandem. And they come about in the, in, in the center. They come together. There's a figure in the center that holds everything together. Now, you actually have this in Muskogee as well. Uh, in Muskogee organization, social organization, the original one, before these uh, societies, these communities were uh, disrupted, um, it was a monarchy, but it was a sacred monarchy. You had a, a chief who was supposed to be descended from the sun. He was actually descended from the sun, sun woman. And <clears throat> he held the power and authority of the sun in himself. And he was given fire that came from the sun and that maintained life, that maintained the, the spark of life, the ability to continue to reproduce your society um, into future generations. So <clears throat> uh, everything revolved around, around him. He was the sun chief. Um, he built a, uh, a platform, a temple, like the ones you see in Central America, that's what these mounds were. And on top of it was the Sun Temple and the Temple of the Flame, the Temple of the Fire, which was being tended by priests, but he, in his name. And he had to be there because everything revolved around him, because he was holding all of this together. Same thing in early Celtic society, and as it continued into Ireland, which was a rather conservative a part of the Celtic world, you had to have a king. The high king was the person who held this together. He was there in the center, and if he wasn't there, if there was no high king, then these four quarters would just fly away into their, their own directions, and they would cease to be in balance with each other. So you had to have someone at the center holding them together. And there were... Um, yearly ceremonials in which this order had to be reproduced. Now, in the Celtic world, of course, we have, um, we have Samhain, which is the great festival of year renewal, and the beginning of winter, you see things as starting again in winter, and uh, in Ireland, certainly, we had the Feast of Tara, which was when Ireland was renewed, that is, then that period of time when the old year was going away and the new year wasn't coming yet, um, the High King had to meet with representatives of all four areas around him and they would all be put into their proper positions ritually and they would meet the New Year that way. So basically Ireland remained in order, right? It was still there the same way, represented in microcosm in Tara when the New Year dawned. Um, however, the um, culmination of the ritual cycle in uh, Celtic tradition, and certainly in Ireland where we know it best, is Lunasa. And Lunasa is the festival of the harvest. And this is where you get the permission of the earth to actually take the crops off out of the, the province of the earth and into the, the grasp of the of human society. And this was also a renewal period because you, by imposing your order on the world of nature, saying that you know you were able to do this, you were able to bring all of these crops into your control and allow your community to remain as it was, to pass on another, another year of, uh, of being what it was, um, you had to reinforce all of the institutions of your community at that time. And so this was the period of fairs, this was the period of promulgating laws, of renewing contracts and laws and, and making decisions in common for the whole community in public. This was all at that time when the, the harvest was being made. Um, in, uh, and you also had contests. You had uh, sporting events that involved uh, competitions between factions. And very often the, the factions resemble the bipartite uh, universe before the earth comes into being. That is the, the order part and the chaotic part. Um, there's, a, there's a god, of course, who is the, uh, the main figure at, at the center of the event, who's Lu. Lu is the god who is 
all gods in a way. He's the god who represents uh, the dis dissolution of categories, but the, also the uh, control over categories. That is, Luke can be anything, and he can uphold anything. He maintains everything in his grasp because he knows how to do everything. He can't be excluded from any realm of being. And uh, he invented, we're told, all of the sports and all of the games in which there are two sides that interpenetrate each other. He created ball games, he created chess and board games, and things like that. And this is a large part of what takes place uh, on Lunasa. Now, in uh, the Muskogee ceremonial, of course, uh, and this is all over the southeast still, right, the great ceremonial event is what's called the Green Corn Ceremony. In, uh, in Muskogee, it's called Poskida. Yeah, the, the V's actually on <laughs> Poskida. Um, and this is very similar to Lunasa. It's a celebration of the harvest. It's you. It happens in summer when the corn, the green corn, is just soft enough that you can eat it, actually. And. It's an offering, of course, of the fruits of the harvest, but it's also a, uh, a celebration of the ability to, to have this relationship with the, with the earth. And it's also a renewal of the entire community. Incidentally, the, um, the uh, Mohegan Sun, I think it is, or the, uh, uh, the Indians in the in, uh, Stonington area, the mm -hmm. casinos, have, they call it Shemitzen, and mm -hmm. uh, the festival of the green corn. So this is sort of a neo- mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. which is going on in Mundania. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, again, as I said, all through the eastern seaboard, there's mm -hmm. some similarity in ceremonial with the southeastern cultural complex because it was so influential. You know, this was like, these were like the big cities of North America, and their, their cultural influence really radiated all over um, the area, all the way to the Atlantic. So um, there are also uh, games that foster social cohesion and, and an appreciation of the structure of the community in itself, as the different clans, for instance, compete in these games. And it brings about a consciousness of how your society is actually structured and you want to keep it that way. Now, there's a figure who is involved with uh, the Green Corn Ceremonial, who is called Tastanagi in, in, uh, in Muskoki, and he is very much like Lou in the sense that he is a warrior hero. He is the one who um, comes about as a kind of uh, union between opposites. And uh, he invents the ball game. They, uh, all the southeastern peoples had a ceremonial ball game, which was rather like the Central American one, except it was less bloody. <laughs> you didn't have to, <laughs> to kill one of the yeah. winning team. <laughs> But you, uh, uh, but you, it was probably no more so than than a modern soccer game, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you, the audience. but it had the same kind of ceremonial purpose as the Central American uh, ball game, and it features as one of the as the, one of the central parts of this ceremony, so that you can again see the similarity between the, the ethos, the way of looking at what the harvest is and how it relates to your community, how it relates to your field as a, as a, as a human society, the, uh, the southeastern model and the, uh, the Celtic model. You can easily put yourself in the same mind frame if you're not doing exactly the same things, and the crop is very different, but you can sort of understand why they're doing what they're doing. If you're teleported from one culture to the other, you would pretty much recognize after, you know, a little bit of adjustment. Oh yes, they're doing Lunas. Or, oh yes, they're doing Poskida. Okay. So, yeah, I wanted to talk about the serpent too. The serpent is another interesting um, crossover uh, in Celtic art. Of course, all of you have seen pictures of Kevin Unos, the, the god on the Gunnistrup Cauldron. At least we call him Kevin Unos because that's the only name for him we know from uh, from the the. Uh, the altar that was founded in Notre Dame in Paris, where his name is given. And all the few references. But the Gunderstrup Cauldron is was probably made like a thrace for a... Yes, it was probably done as a commission. Commission for a Celt. Yes, exactly. By somebody who'd never seen an elephant. Yes, or <laughs> new elephants probably from coins. <coughs> yeah. seen stylized elephants on coins. Mm. Introduced that. 
Yeah, some people think that the, the goddess there uh, on that panel with the elephant uh, there as well was meant to be Gajalakshmi. It was meant to be Lakshmi with elephants. But again, the artist had never seen an elephant and then just you put an elephant in this panel somewhere with this woman bathing, you know, holding her hair. But uh, that's a theory. It's possible that uh, there was this concept from Indian art that was trying to be introduced in this uh, uh, in this particular panel, but you can't prove it since you don't have a label. But anyway, Kanunas is on the most famous panel from that uh, art object, and he, of course, is holding a horned serpent. And you see the horned Celtic art quite a lot, and especially in later Iron Age Celtic art. Um, it's a, again, it's not a purely Celtic concept. It's, it's found across Eurasia. In fact, uh, if you remember uh, Kaisho Sereth, uh, who did presentations here a few years ago, and he he showed um, pictures of the motif of the horned serpent, beginning in Bronze Age China and gradually moving across the plains of uh, Eurasia into the Celtic world, where it becomes a Celtic icon in particular. And uh, the horned serpent is found with Kernunus in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of representations of Kernunus, and it's also found by itself. And the Boii, the uh, tribes who lived in Central Europe that gave their name to Bohemia, they seem to have been particularly attached to, to that image, and they had coins with the, the horned serpent on it. Uh, the horns are usually ram's horns. Sometimes they use they look like little, you know, goat kid <laughs> horns, but they're usually ram horns. They're coiled. So they're different from the, the Muskoki, or general southeastern uh, image of the horned serpent with antlers. But there's the same idea that there are two horns, and uh, that this figure has to be controlled by someone. Uh, the idea, the image of Kernunos is holding the horned serpent and holding out a ring, right, holding out a torque with his other hand, is uh, what he's saying is, uh, I keep dangerous things at bay, and I give you good things. Okay. It's interesting that yeah. the name of Kernunos is almost cognate to Karamnos, which is thunderbolt in Yeah, Greek. but it's, it comes from a different... Yeah, you mean, but it, it means sounds just horn like, one. Yeah, but it sounds Karen, like... Karen, uh, like, like corn in cornucopia. Yes, yeah. it's simply corn. It just but it is corn. an interesting uh, homophone because yes. that you do have a thunderer. It means something like great one of horns, Karaunos, mm. battling the water keeping serpent in so many yes. cultures. Mm. Yeah, and so he has basically, yes, the, the serpent is the dangerous power of the land. It's desirable because it's the energy, the living energy of the land, right? It's what makes the land fruitful, what makes the land creative is this wild. Uh, growing presence in it, and yet it's also dangerous because it's not kept in, at bay by any kind of human concepts. So you need to have some force that protects you from it. Or makes it give up the waters, because if that's... Yeah, but that's, that's yeah. one aspect of the myth. Yeah. And uh, we don't really have the Celtic version of it uh, per se, but it's the same kind of uh, idea of the serpent power that holds the key to this area, to the watery underworld, and allows it to communicate with our world. So, um, in order for this to take place in an ordered fashion that doesn't endanger human life, you know, doesn't just blow up uh, your community, doesn't cause you know, a rush of water uh, mm. destroying you, or withholds the water so that your crops dry up, um, you have to be able to control the serpent. And that's the same idea, again, between the two cultures. The wild power of the land is seen as a horned serpent. Uh, two horns representing the two times of year, the fact that it's the transformation that uh, occurs from winter activities to summer activities. And that there has to be some form of hero who has enough of a perspective on both sides that he is able to control in the name of the lucid upper world, the chaotic powers of the, of the underworld. Okay, now in terms of further ceremonial, do you remember what Bridget's temple was? Was it a well? There was a well, but there was something else in it that was extremely important. So there was a fire. fire. Yes, there was a perpetual fire. 
Um, Bridget, Bridget, when when she got Christianized, Saint Bridget was right. a was a saint of uh, associated with fire right. often. That's right. Yes, she, she, the idea was that her community, the, the Kildare, right, where um, kept a sacred fire. The sacred fire was supposed to be kept only by women. It could only be seen by women. By women. If a man saw the fire, right, he would actually fall dead, or something <laughs> horrible would happen to him. You know, so you have stories of uh, uh, men who try to peer through the hedge that is masking the fire of Bridget, and either they go blind and the eye that saw it, or they try to walk over the hedge and the limb that got over the hedge withers, and things like that. So, um, but the important thing is that it's not supposed to go out. And the uh, like it's like the Vestal Virgin. Exactly, it's the same institution. It's the same. You can you can literally say that it's the same institution as the Vestal Virgins. And Perun, the fires for for Perun and Percons. Perun, yeah. Yeah. Depends on your culture. Yeah. No, not influence. Of this is the same it institution. To, no, it's just when, the when you got when you have a, an eternal flame. Yeah, it's it, the it ancestral. Has to be kept eternal. It's by the ancestral. <laughs> it's an ancestral custom. It comes from the same Indo-European idea. Root. Root. That's right. So you have a community of women who keep a hearth fire. The hearth fire is what keeps the community alive. It serves as the center of the community. If you lost that hearth fire, it would be like losing the hearth fire in your own home. Right? You wouldn't have a place to come back to, a place that you could gather around. So you have to have that as being the center of the community. It serves as the hearth fire for everybody. And uh, that's why the city of Rome would cease to be the city of Rome if the Vestal Virgins allowed the fire to go out. The, the empire would fall apart. So or the city would fall apart originally. And that's why the, the temple of Vesta was made to look like a farmhouse. It looked like an old, you know, early, late Bronze Age Italian farmhouse, like the ones that would have existed in Rome when Rome was founded. And it just kept looking deliberately that way in this sort of antiquarian fashion to evoke that time, but you were keeping it from Inside. them. Inside. Inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the same is true of this flame that is being kept, that is serving as the center of the community, in the same way that the High King is what allows the four functional quarters to keep together, the activities that are so different, that are represented by the four quarters, come together in the person of the High King, so that they don't fall apart and start fighting each other and be at cross purposes. So the same way the fire is there to maintain it uh, as a single family. It's the fire that is the fire from above, the fire of the sun. Bridget is also the sun. She's the, the sun as a, a being that exists in our world. Right? The sun and the moon are not in the world above. They're between. They're between, uh, they're between the earth and the world above. So they, they move around. Right? You see them rising and setting. So they move between the upper world and the, the lower world. And Bridget, therefore, through her solar nature, gives fire to people in our world. So it links the above and the below. She's, she has her well, which is water, and she has the fire, which is the upper world. She links them together. This is what causes life, which causes fertility, healing. Everything is when these two principles are combined. In the Muskoki um, ceremonial, uh, layout, you have the same thing, you have a perpetual flame. And this perpetual flame is kept in the mount on one of the mountain temples, and it cannot be uh, extinguished. You can't allow it to go out. The same horrible thing will happen if that flame goes out as if uh, the hearth goddess's flame goes out. So you have that, again, as a basic structure of ceremony that the two communities would have understood immediately. Why you have a fire that doesn't go out, you know, why you have to be careful in tending it. You know, whether you would be a, you know, Mississippian mound builder or a Iron Age Celt, you would have instantly understood what the other was doing, why you had that particular uh, institution. Okay, well, um, now you have a way of looking at your environment, regardless of where you are, right? You, um, you know that high places are places where the above and the below can meet. They're places where you can rise towards the power of the sun, the power of the clarity that exists in the upper world, and you can bring it down 
to your level. You can, so you build mounds, right, so that you're higher than the rest of the landscape and you're closer to the world of divine clarity that's there. Similarly, in the Celtic world, your ceremonial centers, especially for Lunasa, for the, the culmination of the, the ceremonial year, is on a high place. That is, you look for the highest point on the territory, wherever you live, and that becomes your ritual center for this. That is, you have, this is where you meet the powers of the above, coming to meet the powers of the below. This is how you're able to align them on one axis, so that everything can be put in balance along it. Um, now this brings us to sort of full circle to what I had started with. If you're looking at the world through these eyes, or you're looking at the world through these eyes, what you're seeing is something rather similar. It's not at all the world that you see through say, modern Anglo culture, but if you're just comparing these two, yes, they are very similar. So if you want to go back to a, uh, a relationship with the world, with the land, that is based on such principles, whether you're on this continent or on this continent, you're going to find the wherewithal to see the world in exactly those ways. What's more, um, if you know what the ceremonial landscape is like, or was like because of the depopulation of the eastern United States as for its native population, um, you don't have to know the details that come from these cultural sources. You don't have to know all of the details of the ceremony. What you do is you know how you would approach it from here. You can look at that same landscape, you can look at those uh, same features that had a certain ceremonial importance for anyone who lived in that area and who saw the world this way, and you can see it exactly the same way. You can then import the ceremonial traditions that are part of this view, and they will fit on this side because they're really about the same thing. You're just using different words, you're using different images in some ways, you're using... Um, have different crops, right? Different, uh, different things, different preferences in uh, in your day-to-day -day life, but the basic principles that animate all of this are going to be pretty much the same. So your ceremonial is going to work, even if it's not the same one. It's going to be sufficiently, by its very nature, following the same parameters without copying from each other at all. That it's going to work. It's going to be appropriate. What's more, it's not going to, in, in any way, um, debase or attack what was done there in previous times by another culture, right? Because you're still doing the same thing. You're carrying on uh, a similar vision. You don't have to try and appropriate things from what was done there before. You're doing something that's similar enough that it'll fit in. It'll just reinforce what was there before. Similarly, if... Native Americans went to Europe, right? They could do exactly the same thing. They could lo look at ceremonial centers that had belonged to you know, Kel Celtic peoples, and they would be able to do exactly what they were doing in North America with a bit of adjustment, and it would still work. It would be exactly following the same patterns. Okay, well, that was the point I was going to make. <laughs> and if you have uh, questions or... <coughs> Would you say that um, the kinds of parallels that you've described here are more unique or not so? I mean, in, let's say, other European cultures, would you find a similar kind of resonance? I think so. I think, so. I think that, um, see, Celtic culture has in, interested me because it had a very full-fledged ceremonial, uh, which sort of, was sort of eclipsed, of course, because uh, Christianity was really very, very well entrenched in the Celtic world it came there very early and so um, a lot of things were um, eclipsed in a way you know you, you just didn't have the uh, the expression of, of some of the basic theology that was behind the ceremonial early on but you still um, the reason why it was very rich is because um, ooh, <laughs> the reason it, it was very rich is because they had a learned class they had a, uh, a class of intellectuals, very much like the Brahmins in India, or mm -hmm. the Druids, who, whose main interest was ceremonial and theology and speculating about cosmology and remembering all of the details of these, these world structures. 
so that even though most of the cultures of Europe had inherited much of the similar uh, world pattern, uh, the Celts articulated it very well. You know, it was uh, it, in a very rich, rich way that still resonates today. Mm -hmm. So you can adapt this. You can, you know, a lot of the Germanic ideas are very similar in, in, in ways, but um, because they didn't have this very structured priestly class who spent all of their time professionally just talking about these things, uh, it didn't wasn't expressed in, with the same variety, the same exuberance as in the Celtic world. In again in the the southeastern ceremonial complex, you also had priests, you had people who were trained in nothing but uh, dealing with occult power, essentially, with the powers of nature, the powers of the divine. And so they developed an extremely rich way of looking at their environment in the same way, for the same reason. Which again, you might not find in some other Native American groups where you did not have the same kind of organization, you know, people coming together in large mm -hmm. numbers, uh, doing things like this and speculating about this and talking about it and being consulted about it, you know, there mm -hmm. were, it was more spread out and less, uh, uh, sort of at a simpler technological level. The, mm -hmm. the more it, nomadic it, people so yes. probably have a very different mm, Right, point exactly, of view. yeah. You have, you know, traces of this all across the East, as I said, a lot of Algonquian and Iroquois mm -hmm. um, mythology or cosmology is very similar to this in some ways, with a lot of, you know, minor changes, but the general pattern is very similar. A lot of the same figures appear in, under different names in the, the mythology. Mm -hmm. Amazing how universals, you don't, you wonder whether there was any contact between peoples in, you know, very pre-Columbian mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. but if these arose independently, mm -hmm. how yeah. universal this must mm -hmm. be. Yeah. Well, there's some similarity in uh, shaman shamanic studies with Ali Elia, what's it, Mer yeah. Mercedes? Yeah. I never yeah. pronounce yeah. it right. Yeah, yeah, he did He did some work that showed that the approach to the to to uh, this type of, of trance and connection to the spirit world is the same mm -hmm. yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then it, it may have different accents, different a mm -hmm. uh, different uh, address, but the approach is the same everywhere, so mm -hmm. it sounds very similar. Mm -hmm. to yeah, some of it may just be part of human nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the way of looking at things. So but I mean, there's also, there's also di diffusion is possible too, because I mean, people have been moving around for a long time, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean you know, direct trips across the Atlantic. It can be just, I mean, when agriculture was sort of spreading everywhere, it came with a whole package of ideas about relating to the earth. You know, well, it the, could have spread Celts, at a very early time. Mm -hmm. With the Celts, it's, they, found, they have found, it, I was watching, TV isn't all that bad. It, has, it often mm. has uh, <laughs> uh, the latest research on certain topics. They've shown, yeah, they, really it's been down. shown, <laughs> well, but for the average person to begin to understand, it's mm -hmm. a good thing to get them thinking. They found uh, uh, people in China who were who had some kind of Celtic origin because the 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 fabrics yes no I don't think that's true no. are the same yeah no no that's near. that's television that's what television is bad for television takes a sensationalistic well, ad, ad, idea and sort of spreads it out to they to, had uh, they had scholars discussing it I mean it well, was yes, completely but, no I know, I'm sorry I know about this so it's, it's not something <laughs> so, so these these no. uh, these, uh, these people who were Caucasian and looked yes right in certain, right they, well, we know what, they, what, what language they spoke. They spoke a language that was an Indo-European language that was not Celtic at all. Um, that is sort of archaic Indo-European in the sense that it, what it has in common with Celtic is that it has certain verb forms that disappeared in other Indo-European languages but survived in the far west in the Celtic world as well and among the Tocharians, as the language is called, that was spoken in, in China. And uh, yes, they probably did come from Europe at a very early stage. They were not Celts. Um, what about the similarities in, in some of the customs? Well, we don't know about the customs. We just <laughs> just have the, the burials. Well, well, the burials. But, but we have, you know, plaid. Well, a lot of Europe wore plaid. Hey, it's they not had necessarily it in uh, Neolithic Denmark, for Pete's yeah. sake. Yes, plaid is just, I mean, again, it's like playing the harp or the bagpipes, you know. So Neither I the harp nor the bagpipes are Celtic instruments, but they became Celtic. They became Celtic because the Celtic cultures were the last people who actually made 
a lot of use of them in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we tend to think of the harp and the bagpipes as Celtic instruments. And then you think of the Celtic. So the same thing with the plaid, you know. So what? Plaid. How about uh, northern, northern uh, Spain? Is that because the language makes them Celtic-like? No. But northern Spain, the bagpipes are just, bagpipes are all over Europe. Yeah. Bagpipes originally came from the Middle East. Yeah, but the, they became popular in Roman times. But in Galicia, they're supposed to have connections to Celts. Yes, but it's mostly romantic. You know, it's mostly oh, it's 19th no century linguistic romanticism. Linguistic connection. No, it's no, there's no linguistic. Or musical tradition. No, no. There, what there was was simply that Galicia was a part of Spain that was never conquered by the Moors. So it remained much more. Most of northern Spain remained much more like the rest of Europe than the south of Spain, which had this Arabic influence. So uh, Galician music, you know, Galician folk customs, the way Galicians look, everything, um, is much more like what you find, say, in France or Britain than, than in the rest of Spain. So you could say, yeah, it's sort of more Celtic because there's a Celtic influence all over Europe. So they're more like that than southern Spain, which has this overlay of, you know. But no real connection. No, except nowadays in the modern imagination, they see, well, the Celts were our ancestors, you know, and that's what makes our identity. We're different from other Spaniards because we have this Celtic background. Galician is a dialect of Portuguese. It's not uh, Celtic at all. Yes, but the pre there were languages before that. Yes, but there were, all Spain was Celtic in that case, except the southern mm -hmm. seaboard. I mean, there were Phoenicians okay, and there were right. Iberians mm -hmm. in the, in the uh, uh, southeast. But, I mean, otherwise, you know, there were Celts everywhere in Spain. Uh, that influence remained less strong elsewhere. Uh, because of the Moors, so yeah. But I mean, so the the, the mummies in China again, they're not Celtic. So, again, that's a way of drawing spectators by saying, "Hey, they were these Celtic mummies." No, they were not Celtic. There are certain similarities with what was going on in Europe during the Iron Age. They had some of the technology. Well, I think that's ideas. all was said. It was similar yeah. with yeah. the impression that the same, came from the same root. Well, they were Indo-Europeans, and we know what language they spoke because their Buddhist uh, missionaries wrote in. The two languages. So there are variations. They're just not yeah. as direct as. Yes, they're not Celts, but they're Indo Europeans, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they did, obviously, from the mummies, they did have a Euro you know, European look as opposed to a Chinese look. And you still have people in, in, in Turkestan who have that look. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know plaid was, was, and, uh, every, was uh, common all yeah. over Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It's a very easy pattern to make mm -hmm. when you're weaving, mm -hmm. particularly if you don't, if you only have so much of a dye mm -hmm. bath. Mm -hmm. But that would be Northern Europe, because uh, obviously, in the, well, I, I think Greece and Rome. They tended to dye the entire fabric after it was woven, whereas mm -hmm. you dyed the yarn right. and, uh, and then wove mm -hmm. more in the north. You mm -hmm. didn't dye the whole garment, you dyed the, the yarn. plaid wasn't f common there. Yeah. It wasn't commonly used. So, uh, yeah, the, they apparently called themselves Kroraina, was their own name for themselves. And uh, the name of the city in China, where, which was seen as still in the Middle Ages as their center, was Lolan. And apparently, Lolan was the Chinese pronunciation of Kroraina, which is what the city is called in their own text. And there are still there are pictures from uh, medieval China that show people from that area, and they're portrayed as caricatures of Europeans, you know, with long noses and, and so forth. Yeah.